we're trying to be um, like a like a lived example that it's that it's possible to adapt to um, small scale living to, to low energy, low carbon living and to thrive. Ashley Colby is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Ashley is the executive director of the Rizoma Foundation. She earned her PhD in environmental sociology with a focus on household food production in the United States. Her dissertation was published as a book, Subsistence Agriculture, in the U.S. connecting to work, nature, and community. I've got the book right here. I'm <laughs> excited to talk to her about it. It will be absolutely fabulous. It was in the process of completing her research that Ashley discovered the creativity in individuals creating diverse and formal economies unnoticed by policymakers and politicians. Ashley is interested in and passionate about the myriad creative ways in which people are forming new social worlds in resistance to the failures of late capitalism and resultant climate disasters. Ashley is a qualitative researcher, so she tends to focus on the informal spaces of innovation. Uh, Ashley's focus has turned to Rhizome Foundation, where she seeks to accelerate local decentralized networks of people who can get us to the next iteration of society as fast as possible, I, I imagine. <laughs> Ashley, welcome to the show. It's so good to have you. Thanks so much, Mark. I'm I'm really honored to be here. R really, really honored. Thanks. Ashley, it's a it's a sheer pleasure. And I, and I have to let our listeners know. Um, I read your book, then I reached out to you to to to, dis to discuss it on the podcast and kind of there was some things that just really touched my heart, some, some words that you use in the book that I feel are the direction that we need to go as humanity, as far as subsistence farming, as homesteading, as regenerative agriculture, and uh, that will be a, a big solution to a lot of the woes we have, not only uh, with climate and environment, but just as human health and, and the suffering that we're seeing around the world. Um, it's, it's a short read, so you're not very thick, but it was your PhD work. So it was your thesis, correct? Yeah, it was my, yep. And my dissertation for, um, my PhD at Washington state university. Yep. I've heard you on, on a few other podcasts and you said sometimes between the publishers and, and those you were working with on the thesis that sometimes it was a little struggle, a little battle. Why was that? Is it so cutting edge? Is it so different than, than what they've heard in, in the academic world before? What were some of the reasons that that came out? Sure. Um, so when it, I guess to back up a little bit, um, I started to get interested in sort of small scale food production before I even went to graduate school. Um, after college, I was kind of doing the typical, you know, international travel on a shoestring, trying to, you know, see the world, find myself and found myself drawn to these small scale markets and like food culture and, you know, people just bringing things in from the local region and producing things locally and eating seasonally. And it was always so interesting to me um, how common that is around the world. And so when I went to grad school, I thought, you know, maybe I'll focus on um, something like small scale food production and, and see if I can find out, um, you know, as a qualitative researcher, you know, interviewing and doing ethnography, um, what it is people, if there, if there is a movement for small scale food production in the United States and, you know, can I find people? And if I can find people, you know, what, what do they have to say? What are the reasons behind it? Um, <clears throat> but then, you know, bringing this up to my committee, um, 
who, who wants to know what is the sociological significance, right? Like, what does it matter? There's a few people with tomatoes, who cares? You know, it's just like a, it's a hobby. It doesn't, it's, it's a fringe. It's not central to anything. It's not central to our economy. Um, it's not central to, to anything that sociologists care about, which is a lot about, you know, inequality and social structures, institutions, this kind of thing. Um, so um, I had to fight a bit that, that I think indeed it is something significant while it might be um, not a huge number of people taking part yet. Um, I make the argument that it's a it, uh, small scale production, not just food production, but even craft production um, is kind of our, our normal state. It's our normal economy historically, like as, as human beings, we're, we're normally create things and, and um, normally, if I say normal, I mean, you know, the, for the most amount of time in human civilization and in the most parts of the world, most people would be involved in some form of production, you know, just food centrally, but, you know, goods and, um, and services and, and, and even home um, production, the production of and processing of, of things in the home, home economics. Even down to um, gardening, right? Right. Gardening. I mean, even down to like making cheese or processing um, things to be stored for winter and this kind of thing. Um, this is common. This is normal human stuff. And I think um, <laughs> it's just we're so far removed from that um, over the course of a few generations, especially in the United States, but you know, other um, advanced countries that um, it's almost like we're forgetting that. So um, I kind of had to make that case that there's a, that there's a sociological significance to this. Um, and I, I actually ended up going back to sort of um, Marx and Weber who are like the, the original sociologists to to draw on some of their analysis talking about the movement to modernity and how it moved people out of these, you know, smaller scale craft produ production economies. Um, and I was, you know, I, I used those, you know, sort of, I guess, original text, uh, sociological text to make my case that it was something worthwhile to study. So uh, I ended up winning because I ended up writing it. So that was good. <laughs> That's amazing. And you won in a lot of places. So there's a lot of things that we'll bring up in the book where I think you probably had a fight and you won. Um, not to put any negative light or anything on your university or where you wrote your thesis, uh, but why was it so out there that subsistence agriculture, farming in general, didn't tie to economies? I mean, what what age were they in? Were they still stuck in the dark age? Because uh, as far as my version of the history, and, and I think as yours as well, isn't isn't the world's oldest and most successful, longest running economies in the world an agrarian society? Over right. 10, 10 to possibly 12,000 years old, right? Yeah, I mean, yes. And this is so funny. I mean, I think part of what um, what I'm always fighting against is that, um, well, I think part of it is an analysis of the academy itself. Everyone in the academy has become so specialized that they don't take a large view of things. And the, what's funny historically is that it, it turns out just because of the history of the land grant university system in the United States that um, it was rural sociology that studied anything to do with farming or agriculture. And that was just considered a sort of, you know, niche side, um, more applied, less rigorous, less theoretical. And, you know, you, you can hear in these words, judgment, value judgments, right? You know, it's not and in, in the academy, things are built around prestige. They're built around, you know, who gets, um, who's using the most up-to-date theories, et cetera. So to try to talk about um, sm small scale agricultural production in the context of environmental sociology, um, it's just a, a sort of a fringe and a niche thing. And it just it happens to be because that's just the thing that people, you know, weren't, the, the main researchers who are the most prestigious aren't it, are interested in it. So um, it's one of those things where I've, uh, I've, I've have a history of just being headstrong about my interests and my desires and what, and, you know, I kind of have this attitude, you only have one life to live. So just, you know, <laughs> do what you're passionate about. And, um, and I did have to fight that, but it's, 
you know, it's no, no real knock on um, the university. It is extremely um, widespread, the belief that um, small scale food production is backwards. We've moved beyond that. This is the, this is the thinking. This is not my thinking. Um, but the, this is a very, very common thinking in almost every discipline. You know, we're beyond that. We can't go backwards. Um, we're forward. We're progress. There's all these metaphors of time moving forward, you know, and, and that would just be a backward step. And um, we can get into this in more detail, but the way that I think about it is we can sort of learn and take the best and from the past, the most balanced part of the past. But that doesn't mean we have to forget all of the things that we've discovered and all of the best, um, you know, technologies that might be helpful to us in the future. But it, you know, I think just pretending um, that we have nothing to learn from the past is is sort of hubristic. Yeah, uh, I, I, I would totally agree. And thanks for kind of uh, updating us on, on that. And, and uh, the, with the academia, it's, it tends that we deal with a lot of these specialists, these experts, these siloed thinking, and we don't understand how the bigger world connects, uh, uh, not only uh, as systemic thinking, but as this symbiosis, this regeneration, which we will talk to, about as well. I want to ask you some a couple personal things. First and foremost, I'm honored and thank you for writing a contribution in my book, Menu B. I want to let all the listeners know that you're one of the new contributors. We've added you to the website and that you'll be contributing a nice section to the book, Menu B. And so thank you for that. But I know a little bit more about your backstory and where you're at now. You're in Uruguay, your family. Yep. And, and I, I kind of if it's okay, if it's not too personal, I want to ask why. Did you escape from the craziness of the U.S. and maybe some systems that you don't like? Or was it that's the best place to, to do some farming and kind of some of the things that you do to, to, uh, your, to find your niche in the world to really be successful and thrive because we only have one life to live? Right. Um, yeah. So it's basically all of the above, but um, the story is basically is more or less, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting, I, I traveled all around the world. Um, like I mentioned after uh, college to something like 35 different countries and just saving up money as a, a nanny and then going on these overland trips, you know, buses and all sorts of crazy places. Um, and um, just sort of getting a sense that, you know, there's, there's a big world out there. Um, and there's a lot, lots of different places one might land. Um, and then going to graduate school and getting my PhD in sociology, um, I had an inkling about the state and the direction of the world, but that really cemented the details for me <laughs> about um, how much deep trouble we're in, you know, I mean, not just environmentally, but, you know, socially and, um, you know, I, I have all these sort of big ideas about how, how things can change socially, environmentally, about how you can build community. Um, but I did feel like where I'm from, which is the south side of Chicago, I, I was just swimming against the current every day, all the time, <laughs> in every way to try to make that, that vision a reality. So I figured maybe I can go to a place that is a little further along on my vision um, and or already has a history or culture of it where I can not only um, sort of live the way that I want to live closer to the land and, and, you know, with a lot of time dedicated to my children and my family. Um, but uh, maybe I could, I could live that way and then bring some of those insights back to the U S. And so um, a lot of my, my project has been more or less to experiment with these things, um, which includes things like homesteading. And um, we have like this, we have a small scale rural school where my little, my little girls go and it's like a one room schoolhouse. So I talk about that model for education and to think about education different ways. So the insights from this place, this culture um, and our experimentation as, you know, people from the West um, in a from a very developed city, um, trying out these different things. Um, and Uruguay specifically <clears throat> is just a really great place um, for this particular um, goal that I have or set of goals. It's just, 
I mean, there's a huge culture of sharing and cooperation, interdependence. There's a huge culture of small scale production. So, you know, when we first came here and we, and we bought some land, um, people who we were meeting were saying, oh, you know, why, why'd you come here? Oh, well, well we said, you know, we just basically want to want to self-produce some food and see, try our hand at that. And um, the response was always, oh, how nice. That's a wonderful way to raise kids. Whereas in the U.S., <laughs> when we were saying, you know, we want to live off the land. Well, why would you want to do that? That doesn't make any sense. And, you know, you have your PhD. You should be doing like more ambitious things <laughs> than that uh, kind of thing, you know. Um, so Uruguay is a really, um, it's, 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 um, developed enough that we're extremely comfortable here, um, but we're we're doing all sorts of experimentation with sort of low energy living and and small scale production and um, trying all all sorts of uh, you know different community building exercises and we've got really good community here um, that helps me you know to translate insights back to um, people around the world. We were on the uh, Jim Jim Rutt podcast show. <clears throat> And you mentioned that you kind of stepped away from academia and uh, tied to this paradox of different theories and ways of thinking that were continually being presented. And I'd like to hear more about that. You, you touch upon it and some different theories that we'll also talk about in the book as well. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? And it seems like now you're putting it into practice. You're trying it out yourself and um how is that going and tell us a little more about that story sure um so yeah when um you know there's a couple of different things going on i mean i think all of these things at least in my mind they're interconnected and academia is in crisis mode i mean there's just less and less jobs there's more and more people graduating there's just this extremely stressful path to get a tenure track position you know you get into an adjunct position for years on end and you're making poverty level wages and you're moving your family everywhere and you're never settled anywhere and um you know i i just figured if i want to um really experiment with like a high quality life it's academia doesn't give me that option. You know, it really just isn't an option that's available, at least not until you pay your dues for at least a decade or something like that. So I, I figured, you know, my, I've got my life, my life is worth living now. So I'm going to, I'm going to do, I'm going to do it. Um, and um, yeah. And I think uh, moving to Uruguay, we're trying to be um, like a, like a lived example that it's, that it's possible to adapt to um, small scale living, to, to low energy, low carbon living, and to thrive. And, um, and documenting that process, um, and I think this is just, I, honestly, I've learned a lot from the people that I've researched. So I learned about how they did it, and I learned that it, and it sort of made me feel empowered that I could do it myself. Um, and this is the sort of message that I keep wanting to share with other people. Um, you know, I think what what happens is that a lot of people feel like stressed out and anxious and they just don't even, they're, they're on the treadmill, they're in the rat race and they just think like, I feel no sense of meaning from this. I don't even know, I don't even know where to start to take a first step towards a, something that might resemble a more meaningful life, you know? And people are <clears throat> also extremely um, feeling doomer, doomer sensibilities from the state of the climate, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, I figured I would try to take a step in the direction of um, sort of detoxing from like too much consumer culture, too much, uh, you know, too much time on phones, too much, um, you know, I don't know, running from one place to another, commuting, never seeing your kids, you know, uh, always trying to, to seek out that next level of prestige um, and instead see if I could focus my values and my family's values on, you know, connection and meaning and um, maybe the, the act of producing things together and, um, you know, the, the sort of feeling of efficacy you get from, from producing something and, um, and teaching that skill and teaching some skills to my kids um, in that and sort of modeling that for, for them so that they don't have to go through a process where they have to painfully learn it. You know, it's just sort of, it's just normal for their, for their upbringing. Um, I have to say it, it was extremely hard at first to adapt. 
Um, and it's still a very slow process of sort of like detoxification and relearning a bunch of skills. I mean, just the other day I made yogurt for the first time. I never made yogurt before. And I was like, this is so easy, <laughs> but I didn't know I, I never had done it before. And so it's like little by little, I'm building skills and capacities. And when I do it, I think like, wow, oh my gosh, awesome. Now I only have to like buy milk and I can make yogurt. I don't have to buy yogurt anymore. I can make it. And, and anything that I have on my um, fridge, we have honey and we have preserves. I can put those in with the yogurt and flavor it. And you know, this creativity that comes about, um, but it is slow. And, you know, half the time I'm Googling something and trying to figure it out <laughs> through different websites, or sometimes I'm learning from friends. And, um, you know, at first that's just extremely awkward and overwhelming when you're a person who's just main li life is like going to work and then consuming things, buying things, you know? Um, so I think, yeah, I guess my, it's going pretty well. It's going slow. Um, but part of the reason I, I guess, kind of want to evangelize this as, as an, as an option for people is that it is slow going. And when crisis hits, um, it's even harder to adapt quickly, you know? And so if we're, we get to a point where there's crisis and people are looking for some sort of, um, solution, you know, what, what, what kind of way of life might I, I um, pursue to help me solve the problem of the crisis that I'm facing, whatever it is, um, it would be nice if more people were adapting sooner so that it was, you know, a kind of a, a slower, more gentle process of adaptation rather than this shock. And now all of a sudden I don't have uh, warm water. How do I, you know, what do I do to get, I don't have heat, you know, but I'm thinking about um, Texas, this snowstorm in Texas and uh, my, the buildings aren't made for it, you know, and all of a sudden we're in this crisis mode with no skills, you know, so I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, that trying to get people just to consider and, and dabble in, in this, this kind of, uh, you know, small It's scale almost like a off, life. off the grid living, subsistence living. It's, um, self-sustaining um kind of kind of a direction uh, not to put you in a, a, you or your family into a, a, a box but would you would you say homesteader would you say subsistence farmer would you say nomad i mean is there a term do you want to stay away from terms what what's <laughs> kind of what's the evolution or what's the direction um that you're going in and and uh to, to end up that the, the answer to that question, is it because you feel this angst or unease with the world systems that they're not able to possibly support the basic needs of, of you and your family? And that's why you're taking it into your own hands to make sure you have the skills and the tools to be able to do that yourself? Yeah, so... Um... <laughs> On, on the on the label question, I never really called myself a homesteader until I got onto Twitter and I found that there's a bunch of other people out there per, per, like experimenting with the stuff that, that I'm doing and they're calling themselves homesteader. So, you know, for, for I'm a sociologist for ease of, you know, norms and, you know, labels, I'm going to go ahead and, and use that term so that they, you know, s sort of know that I'm part of the club. Um, I like to say low carbon or low energy living because i think no matter what we need to have a low energy lifestyle and a low and we are going to have a low carbon future like they say it in spanish coc yes or yes like that's going to happen so um my my perspective is to sort of adapt to a low carbon future before being forced to um and to do a lot of experimentation with the like, sort of low carbon living um, without, um, you know, the pressure of crisis, you know, I don't want to wait to learn how to, uh, keep chickens until I can't get eggs. You know, I want to learn the process and advance it. If there is a point at which, um, you know, for example, global supply chains break down and you can't get certain things, it's, it's, um, it would be nice, to, oh, you know, I guess I want to say explicitly, I do think that globalized economies, and like globalized supply chains uh, need to go away, um, not completely, but they need to be shrunk down so significantly. And our local product productive capacities, um, whether it's at the home scale or the community scale or the, even the nation state scale would be so much better than what it is. 
um, there's a there's a process there. It's like you know these these uh, sort of I talk about it in my book a little bit. The dual process: one system is is failing or changing so rapidly, the other system must um, you know come to being to to address people's needs um, that that the first system is failing to meet. So. Um, yes, so I do think that we're, um, we, we both need and have no choice about a low carbon future. So um, we might as well start, um, you know, experimenting with what that means. And I think there's nothing lower carbon than like local, I mean, my chickens are backyard chickens, they, they, they use very little feed, and it's just free protein. I mean, they're really just walking around our yard. Um, the, the eggs are free protein. So it's, um, these kinds of things, um, when I talk to environmentalists, environmental um, writers or thinkers, um, they tend to think that this is silly. They tend to think that it's backwards or it's not significant enough. Um, but I, I really can't see another um, solution um, that would be top down that would solve um, the, the carbon problem so thoroughly or so significantly um, as to sort of transform our entire, our entire economy, our entire way of living, um, you know, without some measure of more localized production and more people involved in small scale production as they have been for most of human history. It's not, you know, rocket science and it's also not um, something that's just like totally off the wall. It's very, very normal stuff. Um, and if you ever go anywhere around the world, that's not, you know, the most advanced urban center centers of the global North, you know, that there's like, even in Eastern Europe and in, in little towns, you have people, everybody's got little gardens and little chickens and, um, this is sort of a normal part of life. So, and I think I've, I'm trying to, to, to advance that message. It's a pretty normal thing, you know? Is that a conundrum or what? Why, why do you think that they think it's silly? Why do you think environmentalists think it's silly? Is, is that the right, right direction? Is it, um, what's your, what's your thinking behind that? I, I have very strong thoughts about this. Um, I think that um, people are taught that the solutions, you know, if, if, if I think about, um, for example, when I took a social movements class, People think social movements specifically, um, the way you get social changes, you go out and you protest. And when you protest, you you got your signs and you demand change. And when it comes to um, ushering in a low carbon future, I, I really don't even know. I mean, there's a few things you could do legislatively, but that, that demand change, it doesn't happen. Um, you don't get a low carbon, an entirely transformed localized economy by demanding change, you could maybe get them to put more um, limitations and regulations on fossil fuel companies, for example, but that has to be simultaneous with the bottom up change of transforming ourselves, transforming our economies, transforming our relationship to one another. Um, and I don't want to sound neoliberal or anything like it's, it's only individuals can do these things. But um, part of I think the the specific point of view that I I have that I I don't really hear a lot of people repeating is if we need a new society from the bottom up okay and it's and it's going to be some mix of the old traditional ways of doing things and the and the new inventions that we've come up with as as a species um, the only way to get there is through this process of adaptation and experimentation you know what works I have a solar water heater out in the back of and outside of my yard. The way it works is sun shines on black tubes and it heats up the water inside. I am so glad that that has been invented. Um, you know, I think maybe you could go to the, the Arizona state legislature and say every single person has to have um, one of these solar water heaters in their house. Sure, that's one thing. Um, but then the people have to learn how to use the solar water heater. It's a different form of technology that they have to get used to. For example, um, in the winter here, I can't take a shower till like 3 p.m. at the earliest because I have to wait for the sun to shine all day. So I say this because I think that the, the to live a low carbon life, um, one must figure out how to adapt um, and this adaptation has to happen at the individual family and then community level. 
Um, and so the reason a lot of environmentalists think we can, we can just legislate this, you know, and then you've got these protesters out there, but I really don't even know um, they're legislating to like um, to, to put um, regulations on fossil fuel companies. Yes, but if all fossil fuels went away tomorrow, we would have a huge process of adaptation to learn how to live without them. I mean, every part of our lives is, is subsidized by fossil fuel. So um, that's why I argue for this slow, iterative, experimental process at the community level where we're sort of learning, co-learning, recreating. Um, and I think, you know, I think it's just a, a mismatch with how people think social change happens, but actually the, the scale of social change we need, it's just, it's too much to legislate. I mean, even if you could get the legislators to care or change any laws, what would you be asking for? It's, it's, it's just too much. The transformation, it, it certainly has to be everybody, you know, everybody at once kind of thing. The education process of those politicians and legislators uh, are so hard because they're not educated in farming or energy um, and multiple systems. They're also very specialized and in, in expert roles where they say, oh, well, you know, I'm really good at energy or I'm really good at agriculture or industrial agriculture. But all these other things you're talking about that play into the big system of life, you know, the systems view of life, the web of life, um, I can't tell you about. And so it's always these siloed linear yep. lateral approaches to solving global grand challenges. And that's not how the world works. And so I love that you brought that up Two two things. So a lot of people misunderstand globally that industrial agriculture is, is big. It's a big driver, but it's a small portion of the world's food production. The larger portion is homesteaders, subsistence farmers, small hold farmers, small medium mm -hmm. enterprise farmers that are doing farmers markets, organic food. All of those together is upwards of 75% sometimes, you know, depending on what, what crisis is in the world up to 80% now, especially during the COVID have moved into homesteading and into subsistence farming. Um, in your book, you actually do a study. You go out and, and speak to subsistence farmers and farmers, um, mainly in Chicago. But I'd like to hear if there, you know, what other areas. And also, since the book, how many other areas have you heard from? How, how many other farmers? And um, tell me some of the aha moments that that you had that you talk about in the book. Uh, with these farmers. Uh, one of them is really, and I'll let you tell it in your own words, but it's kind of like, you're like, boy, this farmer's a uh, environmentalist and they don't even know it. But the way they're <laughs> yeah. living is, is pretty damn good, actually. Yeah, right. So yeah, and I think, so I'll, I'll get to that. But I think just to, to bring what I'm going to talk about to your previous point, I think when we're thinking about environmental social change, you know, the people who are out there protesting, they're people who consider themselves, they will self-label themselves environmentalist. And that tend to be left-leaning, highly educated urban people. Um, and I think that the, the, the kind of person who might label themselves environmentalist is a pretty narrow niche and we need a bigger tent. And so I, you know, set out on the, uh, when I'm doing my research to, to be completely open-minded, who, you know, who might be an ally here um, in this movement to a low carbon future? Is it, are we excluding people who are natural allies and, or who are actually doing low carbon living? And the answer to that was yes. So, um, you know, the first thing is, um, when I went to interview people, I said for my book, okay, you have to produce at least 50% of your own food to be in my study. Um, and I don't know if I'm going to find anyone in Chicago who's doing that in or around Chicago. I did the suburbs too, and uh, rural areas um, around Chicago. I interviewed people and um, it was so easy to find people, which was the first clue to me, like, wow, this is actually pretty amazing. There are a lot of people producing a significant amount of food um, in and around the city. And, you know, and they, they, the, the other thing is when you're a researcher, you're doing um, what we call snowball sampling, where you find somebody and you ask them to, you know, introduce you to other people. Everybody knows each other in this community. That was another 
key and a little aha moment, like what's going on here? Um, you know, we're, we're, we're told that everyone's atomized and no one knows their neighbor. And, you know, everybody here in this little community of producers knows each other, what's going on. Um, so basically when I first started interviewing people, I'm asking them, why'd you get into this? And I got this sense that they're sort of, um, people reach some sort of crisis point, uh, whether it was, I don't trust the quality of the food. You know, there's all these food recalls. I don't trust labels. Um, they seem like they say one thing, but then, you know, then there's, there's issues with the quality of the food. Um, some people like for reasons of poverty, couldn't access food, food deserts, you know, they couldn't get quality food where they lived. Um, so they got into self-production in one way or another. And, um, when they got into it, what was surprising to me is, um, you know, in sociology, there were a lot of studies of people who do um, like sort of they do organic um, consumption, meaning they like go to Whole Foods and they think that's their um, contribution to the world, which is good. It's not a bad thing, but um, they go and buy organic food. And, you know, it's just this kind of, you know, I'm protecting my own household attitude and it sort of stays there in the household. And it's only really accessible to people who have the money to shop there and that kind of thing. What I found is that when people start doing this sort of food production, it's a whole different ball game because they have to figure out what they're doing. Like I was saying with the, with the yogurt. <laughs> so they start reaching out to other people or they take classes or, you know, there's like one or two places in and around Chicago where you can um, get chicken feed, because of course that wouldn't be like a common thing you can get uh, in a place where there's not a lot of small scale production. Um, so people go to the same stores to get the chicken feed and then they start meeting with each other and then they start um, sharing contact information. And can I give you a call if I have issues <laughs> with my chickens and this kind of thing? Um, and they sort of built out um, uh, relationships and networks of um, what I call communities of practice. So for example, in Chicago, there's the Chicago chicken enthusiasts <laughs> and they have a website and they have a, a, an email listserv and they, they, a couple of people um, teach classes in it. And um, the other aha moment that you were referring to before is um, when I went to interview rural people, um, you know, I sat down with them and, you know, coming from, you know, academia and I'm from the south side of the city and, you know, I'm, I'm just so out of my element talking to these rural people and, and um, who are, you know, big into hunting and fishing and all this. And so we sit down and I'm talking about, you know, well, how'd you get into the hunting and fishing and, um, you know, what are your biggest concerns? And I remember I have a, a, a man in the book, uh, Marty, um, it's pseudonym, um, who we're sitting and talking and he's going on and on about, industrial fishing and fish life cycles and how there's there's all this waste getting tossed off of um uh boats and barges and and uh cruise ships. yeah yeah and how how unfortunate this is yeah. and how he's seen it happen and um and how when he goes hunting he wants to respect the amount of um tags he was given to to hunt with and how important it is to keep the ecosystem intact and and he talks about his garden and and i'm thinking like this guy's an environmentalist, you know? I mean, he's he's not just talking the talk, he's walking the walk. Every part of the way in which he produces food is with a concern for the environment. And he's, and he's producing, he's producing locally. Um, it's very low energy um, production and he, he truly cares and is a steward of the land that he's, he's getting um, food from. And of course, he would never call himself an environmentalist. And what was the 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 um, the the main point that I know this is? He said it's not climate change. Climate change is a hoax. And this is a really important was a really important insight for me because I think it's okay. And this is something I've been thinking about more and more to build big tent movements around um, shared production, shared activities, shared behaviors, communities of practice. Um, if, if, for example, we want to live a low carbon life, um, why don't we build communities of chicken keepers and communities of sustainable hunters and communities of um, yogurt makers and cheese makers and this kind of thing. Um, and I, I had this um, several different experiences where there were meetups of people on specific topics. One of them is called the um, 
the Urban Livestock Expo. It was in, in February, every uh, February in Chicago, which is freezing cold. Um, in the city, um, city of Chicago High School, there were a bunch of people who keep small scale livestock in this in this high school, um, talking about livestock, talking about goats, um, chickens, ducks, bees, um, keeping, keeping livestock in and around the city and the diversity of people talking to one another at that event. And they walk right up to one another, just, oh, you know, oh, I, I had mites in my chickens this year. Like, what, what do you do? Oh, what do you do about the winter? What do you do this? And just talking shop. And I think the, the insight I got from that was so profound because when I've been at political meetings, let's say, for example, environment with other environmentalists, all we're doing is talking ideas, you know, oh, well, no, we got to do degrowth. Oh, no, we got to do this. It's capitalism. It's not. And it's like, you know, we're just talking about ideas and not really getting to the nitty gritty of it. Um, and we're arguing all the time and disagreeing. Whereas in, in this case, there were, there were ways to make relationships and friendships around the act of learning how to do a real thing, a practical thing. Um, and there's no barrier to, you know, do we all agree? Um, it's really just, do, can you help me <laughs> with my chickens? Can, we, can you give me advice? And um, can we help one another out? And um, we can talk about it uh, a little more in detail too, but a lot of these networks sort of developed into, you know, more social and political and economic ties, which is really cool too. There are so many uh, areas where we can jump off into, <clears throat> I guess, rabbit holes, we could call them. But basically in, in these meetings that you just talked about, sometimes you'll have very affluent, rich people with lots of land doing farming on a big scale, or even just living in the city, making sure they, they've got the best food possible. And so they've got the best chickens and it's, it's beyond whole foods. It's beyond organic. It's really regenerative organic and they're really concerned. And then you have these homesteaders, almost what you also talk about in the book and the, these peasants almost where yeah. we're very poor. We're just doing it enough to eke by to, to kind of self-sustain ourselves that these two different groups that normally probably wouldn't mingle together in, in society are coming together and <clears throat> creating this whole different thing. And they don't even realize that they're environmentalists in some respects of, of what they do. Their political views, their thoughts are, are, are totally different. So I'd love to hear a little more about that as well. Yeah, that's um, that was so heartening to me. You know, as a sociologist, the first thing we want to do is find like, where's the inequality? <laughs> where are the issues? Where are the social problems? You know, and um, another point at which where I where I got pushback from my committee and other places where I presented my research is like, well, what's the problem? I mean, there, of course, there are always some problems. It is, it is, there's a barriers to entry and it's, it's difficult to get going, but the, the, this was such a positive story overall. And so um, exciting that it was just, it, it was just, yeah, it was surprising. So um, here's a fun example. So a lot of people um, who in my study reported um, times at which they couldn't, uh, this is, you know, sort of low income people reported times which they couldn't afford to buy food at the store, their, their family members, usually their dad would go hunting and get uh, a deer and so they would eat venison. And in their mind, venison is a sort of poor food, a food that uh, is, you know, evocative of a time where they couldn't, you know, get pasta at the store, you know, or, or canned um, tomato sauce. I haven't sauce. been to Germany or Europe where you go to a restaurant and that's the most expensive thing on the, right. on the meal. <laughs> yes. Know? So I was going to say then it's so funny because at the same time, um, I talked to people in my study who said going hunting with a fancy hunting club, rich people, very affluent people, um, going uh, hunting with a fancy hunting club and then having their venison processed for them and served at a five-star restaurant, um, that was considered the fanciest thing you could get because you can't buy it in the store. So I thought that was the funniest thing that, you know, the same food can have totally different meanings depending on the cultural context, but either way, um, it's something outside this normal, 
you know, globalized food chain system. And both these people can access it um, by getting out and, and hunting and, and um, you know, eating venison um, through, through their own means, you know, through producing it themselves. Um, what, I, what I also found is people were finding excuses to talk to one another because of production. So um, I had one chapter called Without the Garden, we never would have met him, which was a quote from one of my um, one of my participants who was talking about how they had a garden in their this is this is in the city of Chicago, but um, in a neighborhood where the where the lot sizes were pretty big. They had a garden in their front yard, and um, their na- neighbor from the Caribbean, who they had never talked to before, this this youngish couple with young kids. Um, so the neighbor walked by and just started asking questions about the garden and went, you know, back in the Caribbean where I'm from, I, I would do it this way. And, and they struck up a friendship and then they visited his place. And then it became this thing where they're sort of casually shared tips about the garden and how I would do things and how I'm doing things now. And I'm trying with this variety and this, and to me, um, the, the potential in that is completely explosive. And I heard that story over and over again, you know, people who got chickens and then they get the neighbor kids stopping by looking at them and asking them questions about them. It's an excuse to talk. Uh, it's an excuse to share knowledge um, and to share practices. And so um, for me, you know, it's not just about every person has to produce food and they have to be in yeah, agricultural slavery and, and working and breaking their back every day. It's little amounts of production that bring you little bits of joy and meaning and connection and community. Um, it's, it's absolutely astounding what's possible um, when, you, when you sort of you know, go down this rabbit hole. Um, and, and to me, the, the much more significant finding of my research is not just that there are people out there with gardens. It's the social aspect, you know, that people are connecting to one another across differences of socioeconomic status and gender and race and class and and geography even, you know, and they're sharing information and um, building friendships. Yeah, I love that. I have two good friends. One of them has been on the podcast, Um, Eric Tonsmeyer. He wrote in the book Drawdown on uh, kind of how farming and agriculture is a big role in drawing down um, our, our climate problems and, and carbon. And his last book is called Carbon Farming. And he lives in Boston, Massachusetts. And in, in, uh, I think it's in uh, close to Salem or uh, Durham. And he just has a small little house uh, with a very small lot but it's like a jungle. It's a food forest. And, and the other one um, uh, is, you know, the, the, the gangster gardener, the gorilla gardener, Ron Finley, you know, he just plants in, in his home on his lot and he's got a pool and, and does all this just basically gardening kind of uh, farming in the small space he has but he produces so many different things and plants and flowers and it's amazing that what you can do in such small spaces especially if it's a diversity of so many different crop types and and, uh, we're seeing that more and more whereas I remember when I was younger, if you did anything like that, the, the, the police would come by and, and <laughs> complain about you doing something other than grass that you have to mow in your lawn or a thing, you know. Or the homeowners association. Exactly, exactly. And so um, I, I love that shift in the direction that we're going there. In your book, you, you use the abbreviation SFP quite a bit it stands for subsistence food producers but i would like to maybe if i haven't defined what subsistence agriculture or farming is for you to define that but also for you to tell us in the same the same answer what's the biggest takeaway that you want people to have from this work even though it's phd thesis that you've done into book what's the biggest takeaway that you want people to have Sure. Um, yeah, I think they're kind of related. The answers, you know, I I call them. I I decided to use the term subsistence food producer, 
because there's this the, like homesteader is so fraught people don't really know what that means are you talking about the 1800s and then if you use the word peasant which is actually a common term in like there's a whole peasant studies literature that's like sort of adjacent to sociology and, and geography um that's a common term and an okay term to use too but in the context of the u.s people think what is a peasant you know the, it, it's almost like people think it's pejorative even though it's really not um pejorative in terms of the actual peasants around the world use that term or use some version of it like campesino in spanish um but i decided to say subsistence food producers because the people in my study had to produce at least 50 percent of their own consumption food for their own consumption and i also decided um after looking in the into the anthropology literature a little bit that you know this this um this number you were you were citing earlier peasant agriculture something like producing 70 percent of the food eaten in the in the world um uh, most people who do some sort of small scale production, the vast majority have multiple livelihood strategies. Most people in the world are not farmers solely who are doing some sort of small scale production. Like say they have an orchard, but then they also, you know, have a, a side gig where they, you know, sew, sew clothing or something like that. So, you know, it's very, very common. Um, and I, around the world for people to have multiple strategies for for um, producing, you know, for, for making a living, for, for making a livelihood. Um, and I think what happens in general is that we tend to um, sort of, I, I use this term ghettoize small scale food production. Oh, that's something that happens in the global South. That's peasants, that's different from us. Um, but the more time I spent traveling around the world and then on top of it, you know, interviewing people in Chicago, it is, all, it is the exact same thing. Maybe their job isn't like um, sewing or stitching clothes. Maybe it's um, they're doing uh, coding on their computer, but they have another job and they're producing food. It's, it's the same exact, system um and so i wanted to almost as like a radical point of view to say this is subsistence food production this is the same thing as that um and we need to stop treating you know people in uruguay and people in ghana as if they're different from us we're all the same and we all have these strategies to survive and and we're and it and it's all part of the same sort of web and network of human <laughs> subsistence strategies in the world so um so yeah I, I did that on purpose i called it subsistence food production um for that reason. Um, related, the takeaway is that I think I want people to understand that um, if you're listening from Chicago or Boston or Munich or a, a small city outside of uh, Paris or, you know, London, um, this is normal stuff. This is normal human stuff and getting involved in it um, is a normal activity that's extremely enjoyable. Many people do small scale production and it doesn't just have to be food. I mean, take up a, a spoon carving uh, practice craft, you know, and learn, meet other spoon carvers, you know, basket weavers, whatever it is. Um, getting involved in some small act of production is a sort of way to commune with nature and surprisingly commune with other people and to find connection and community in other people who are who are also interested in this skill set. Um, and I think the, the main takeaway is that we are um, rapidly approaching a low carbon future in which um, access to basic goods isn't guaranteed. Um, and the amount of energy that goes into globalized economies is absolutely astounding. And uh, if energy is continuing to be, um, you know, more and more expensive, these systems are going to transform. So I think both bearing in mind the sort of risk analysis, like acknowledging the risks, risky historical moment we're in and the, the, the precarious um, historical moment we're in and the precarious global um, economic systems, just in time supply chain systems we were facing in combination with how joyful and beautiful and, and lovely the process of, of living a low carbon life can be. Um, I, I just ask you to take something up and try it. And, and, and it is one of those things that I found in my research that it's sort of like a gateway drug where you start with chickens and then you, 
you meet other chicken people and now all of a sudden one of your all of your friends also have bees and now you're a chicken and a bee person and oh now we're all making cheese together and it's just one of those things where you just start building skills um and then building community and it's 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 actually really joyful and and, and the sub title of the book is reconnecting to work nature and community it's it's really all three things and this is something deeply um in both marx's writing and weber's writing it's modernity sort of did, pulls you out of the the the, the meaningful part of work the meaningful uh, connection to nature and, and a meaningful community um this this process of low carbon living and small-scale production really does embed you back in those um those three aspects of life and it's it's good so try it <laughs> I absolutely agree. In in your writing tied to Weber, Marx, and, and other people you reference, but also in the book, you you say something German. You say Gemeinschaft, basically to Gesellschaft. And uh, I speak German, so I know you you speak German, you've 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 researched it, but uh, tell us kind of why you added that. Where does that come from? And what are you trying to tell us with this? Yeah, this is a pretty common um, dichotomy in um, sociology, which um, uh, Weber used these two terms, Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, uh, to, to describe these two different um, forms of social organization. And so um, Gemeinschaft, and maybe you could explain it better than me with a better understanding of German. I don't speak German. I just know these terms because you have to know some German to, to uh, study Marx and Weber. Um, but so the, the basic period. Yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. There's I mean, and it's just necessary. But the, the what I've been taught um, is that Gemeinschaft is a, is a sort of community structure um, where there's sort of interdependence, there's embedded relations, there's social trust, it's sort of organic, um, where wherein people are, ha they have shared responsibilities and shared endeavors to the point that um, you really can't um, <laughs> kind of mess up or if you do it impacts your standing in the community it impacts all sorts of cascading consequences because you ha have an interdependent role within the community um whether it's somebody relying on you for something or buying something from you or you um you buying something from them um and then gesellschaft is this sort of instrumental uh community this this idea that we're all just sort of individual rational actors um we what can we take from one another what can we um get out of one another at the you know what can we squeeze out how can we how can we um sort of exploit one another to the highest degree um and uh everybody's dissatisfied and there's no real um social or community level comeuppance for for bad behavior you know so um the idea being we really want to try to re embed ourselves in a community um where we're needed to one another and where our um our actions have real consequences which then makes us be more responsible and thoughtful um in our relationships with one another and and um you know after writing that and studying the different people in my book, I, I came to Uruguay and I, I basically found a community that already already exists in a version of that. You know, it's um, people show up for one another. I, I my friends ask me to watch their kids and they they watch my kids when I have things that I have to do that I can't bring my kids to do. Um, you know, they they have different activities or, for example, one of my friends is a um, is a, a musician and she asked me to come to her concerts and it's like you show up for people you come to the concerts and then when I have activities, um, they come to my things and um, these kinds of things they they make you have a um, have a sort of reputation in the community of being somebody who, who could be relied upon, um, and then you can rely on others and um, yeah, I think mean, that's that's what we're shooting for, at least. Um, and it's a it's a it's a process in the U.S., but um, I, that's what we're that's that's the goal. Definitely is a process, and it's not just the U.S. It's all over the world. Um, I I have a different term for it, and when when you described it, it really to me is almost a perfect definition of symbiosis. And mm -hmm. in in your book, you you mention neoliberalism, neo Darwinism a few times and <clears throat> there's this overarching um 
human condition that's almost crept into society and our world that it's survival of the fittest, only the strong survive, severe competition, fight and, and scratch your way, your existence out, that we've got to really compete severe competition amongst each other. Uh, and that's where this individ individualism really comes out that, that you discussed as well. And that's not the way the world works. That's not the way the world has ever worked, but it's crept into uh, our world that we think, or a lot of people think uh, worldwide, that that's the way the world works. But our world works really through regeneration and symbiosis, working together with nature, with microorganisms, with other species, with the way we do farming, the way we interact with each other. And that actually, everybody benefits from that, not only our environment and other species, but uh, other cultures, other people around the world, because we go much further. But this neoliberalism, neo-Darwinism, very extractive economies, where it's kind of cradle to grave, we take and throw away, take and use, and it's just kind of a single use process. We're on a planet of finite resources of, of right. uh, uh, that will only work so far. And through the COVID, through the things we've seen in supply chain issues, I think a lot of people are coming to this um, unease or awareness that, boy, that's not the world they want to live in because it's just not working for them anymore. And that there's some, some other things. And um, I'd, I'd like you maybe to address and speak to uh, why you've added those or what your thoughts or feelings on them are. And it almost tickles to a couple other things that, that we see that I, that I want to talk about afterwards. Um, one is really this peasantry, but the other one is hierarchy and collapse. And we've kind of tickled on some something about civilization collapse and and, and where we're coming. You also in the book talk about uh, dual process theory from mm. Morris Berman. And so um, I really like, I like that. And, but it also ties to these kind of three things that I'm asking you about and, and, and I want to talk about next and move into. Yeah. Um, I, I think the, um, my sense, I, I tend to think of things through the lens of fossil fuels because it's just such, having this huge amount of energy just completely transformed all of the, um, I guess, ecological barriers that stopped us from doing um, certain, you know, stopped humanity from, from um, doing a certain level of destruction because we just simply didn't have the energy um, to, to, to exploit in the way that we do now. And, and now that energy is just so overwhelmingly uh, cheap relative, you know, to, to um, all the rest of human history that we're able to pull, to pull all this off. So um, to me, the, the neoliberalism or um, I think uh, this, this idea that we're just individuals and we can get by, we, we really can only pull that off because we have this extremely abundant energy. Um, th through most of human history um, and you know even before the agricultural revolution, um, we were necessarily embedded in community and embedded in nature and we were governed by the rules of ecology, you know, and we can only take so much without giving back until it becomes this thing where you don't, you don't, you collapse or you don't survive anymore. Um, we're, we're kind of on life support, uh, right now with, with the way that we're, um, dealing with ecology and we're just injecting as much energy as possible just to keep that system going. Um, but the way that I see it, is um, we're at the end of that era um, of cheap energy. And so what's next, you know? And I think um, it's, it's the, the transition to the next system, um, in some ways it's, a, it's a, an unbelievable opportunity. I mean, we have all of this insight, scientific and technological knowledge um, that we, that doesn't go away now. You know, we, 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 we know how to do certain things and ideally, and hopefully we don't lose most of that. Um, but we are being forced into a sort of contraction and we are sort of being forced back into um, an embedded relationship with one another and the ecology and being governed by ecological principles. You know, you can only 
um, take so much soil um, until you can't produce things from the soil anymore, that kind of thing. Um, so dual process fits into that. Um, this is Morris Berman. He's a brilliant theorist, um, one of my favorite writers of all time. Um, he, he wrote about this idea that um, capitalism, basically global capitalism, started in sort of 1500 and, ran, and he argues runs through about 2100. So we're right, right here at the end of the, um, of the era. And, and he said, just like other periods of time in history, like the, the end of the Roman Empire, um, as one system is sort of failing um, and, and reaching limits and, and bumping up against, you know, the functioning, it doesn't function anymore. Um, little at the edges, things start to break down. And where those breakdowns happen, um, if, for example, the breakdown means somebody can't access food, um, they're going to figure out a way to access food. So they're going to experiment there. Um, and so one of the examples he was saying is sort of breakdown of, of like the law and political order in the Roman era um, made it so that all these sort of different um, ideological perspectives came about that were that all kind of looked like a version of Christianity. And so at the time, all these people are exploring with these, these different ideological and religious um, perspectives as Rome, the Roman Empire is waning. Um, and then eventually, uh, out out comes Christianity and it turns into the, you know, Holy Roman Empire. And then Christianity is the, is the sort of reigning, um, you know, sociological order of the time in Europe, um, post Rome, Roman collapse. Um, he argues we're in a similar period now where um, the seed of what will come next is being planted now. Um, and all of the experimentation that we're doing at this period of time um, is a result of these failures. Um, and when, when things are uh, failing to, to, when the society's failing to meet needs, people won't just lay, <laughs> lay down and die. They're going to try to survive. And so um, I think there's an example of this in my book, but the example that's even more evocative for most people is Detroit. Um, Detroit's a hollowed out city. You know, it's, it's, it's a post-collapse city. It's, there are, there are neighborhoods in the city um, where people just cannot access goods and food or transport. And, um, and they're not going to just sort of lay there and die. What ends, what has ended up happening is um, there's been all sorts of experimentation there. And there's um, all these things called agrihoods, agricultural neighborhoods coming up there where um, people are building out neighborhoods in the middle of this hollowed out city and basically in the ruins of the city, the ashes of the city, um, building an entirely different economy and way of connecting with other, one another and community and, and production and you know the small scale localized production um, that's organic and, and lovely and, and um, comes with it, like I said, all this forms of community. Um, to me, I think we're just in this, this is the era we're in, you know, where the, the neoliberalism, it's failing. People are, I have a very strong sense of it post COVID. Um, you know, these systems are breaking down um, that we once thought, you know, th that were trustworthy or reliable, they're not anymore. And so um, what comes next, and this is, you know, going back to what I said at the beginning, what comes next is, is a process of experimentation, the seed of what will come next and become the next world order um, is being planted now, we don't know exactly what will end up, you know, germinating and blossoming into the, into the main um, world order. But um, all we can really do in this period of, is sort of set, put, place some seeds and, and sort of make this transition from one to the other um, less ghastly and less, um, you know, feeling like traumatic and crisis and more um, a, a sort of gentle process. Thank you for that. I mean, that, that uh, is definitely not an easy question, but uh, you're, you're well versed because you've written about it um, quite a bit. And and done the research and, and been moving in these circles, there is, is something, I mean, this is probably the best time to bring it up. Um, this collapse, this uh, what uh, Morris Bremen says where we're at at this point, uh, is, it's happened before. We've had more than 21 civilization frameworks Incas, Mayas, Aztecs, early Mesopotamia, the Greeks, the Romans, on and on, that have all collapsed. They're not here anymore. All we have is their ruins. 
Um, and all but two of them collapsed because of ecological or environmental collapse, which is strongly tied to agriculture and food, basic needs, infrastructure, resources. We started to feel now at this point in time, those kind of unease, the insecurity of food supply chain. Is the food going to get here? Is it going to get to our grocery store? Do we live in a food desert? Um, boy, that's the basic thing. I don't care about internet. I don't care about all these. I need food. That's the basic <laughs> deal. I need clean water for uh, and sanitation and, and these basic needs. And it, it, a lot of people feel uh, in the unease around the world, not just in the U.S., not just in, in uh, um, South America or Europe, all over the world. This has been going on. And these 21 civilizations that aren't here anymore, not only did they collapse because of environmental or ecological collapse, but they all had the same model. And we've touched upon this. And so this is the time that I really want to touch upon it, get your, your thoughts and feelings. They all operated on a hierarchy model, where at the top was a few kings and presidents and, and leaders, but on the bottom were the peasants, the slaves, the farmers, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call them. And that model just doesn't work. It's not regenerative. It's not restorative. It's not circular economy. It's not donut economics. It's not planetary boundaries. It's not one where we all kind of get the basic needs and the infrastructure. It's that only a few do. And then that system is a very extractive hierarchy model that has a limit to growth, has an end date, has a collapse date where we have to make that Gaussian curve, that bell curve to make it over or something new is going to happen or, or, or we're going to go away. And, and so I, I want to really talk, because you talk about this in the book, it kind of collapse and, and hierarchy and peasantry. Uh, I, I want to get your thoughts and your feelings on where are we? Do you, do you agree? Do you believe that we need another model, one that lives in symbiosis, that restores the earth, that, that gives us a different system, but also is there a way that we all don't have to become farmers? Because I know people live, they live in San Francisco, they live in New York, they're very happy in their apartment. They don't want to start subsistence farming. They don't, they, they, but they need a different system. They're also filling the woe. So I want to get your thoughts and feelings on that as well. Yeah. Um, I think if I try to think about, um, well, to start, I think I would say um, there's a big difference or a chasm between what like is likely to happen and what ought to happen. There's a big is ought divide, you know? And so um, I think I could talk on and on about how we ought to have a system of pure regeneration and pure egalitarianism and all of this stuff. But then I, I like to um, conjecture right in that pure, uh, the sort of um, historical material reality, like what is likely to happen and how you can just tip in one direction or another. So I, so to, I'm saying that because I, I don't think there's a chance we're going to have a global harmonious egalitarian regenerative perfect society um, without changing a few uh, fundamental things um, and, and specifically what I think needs to get changed and will happen, and, and this is me as a historical Marxist materialist talking, um, I think that the scale needs to be shrunk down um, to human scaled societies. And one of my friends, Joe Norman, he's a complexity scientist, he said, um, we don't need the global village, we need the, a globe of villages, we need to shrink back down to the size of the village scale, or, you know, maybe even to the level of what you might call a bioregion, you know, like a watershed or something like that. This is the this is the coherent social organization that we're um, going to have to go back to, um, and and is and is likely to go back to, and uh, um, because of constraints on energy, um, and will help bring in a, a a society that cannot have the level of inequality that it has now. 
So right now it's because we have a global society, because the chasm is so great between rich and poor, because we have the core societies and the periphery societies that are being exploited on the other side of the world and the people don't see you know, how badly uh, people, factory workers are being treated across the world in order to get their lifestyle that they want to have in the global north. Um, because of that scale of global, um, that's what allows that sort of hierarchy to, to go, to happen. Um, because we're going to be faced, and this is like, again, me, historical materialist talking, because we're going to be faced with low, low energy, low, um, you know, low carbon future, um, the, these scales are shrinking um, back down to a more coherent, let's just say nation state level scale. And then maybe it's a bioregion or, a, you know, even a state. And then maybe there's more coherent culture and productive capacity around a town, you know, where there's all these hollowed out towns um, in New England, the mill towns that used to have a productive capacity and a whole, a whole different culture of producing certain kinds of things. I, I remember I took this tour um, in the Pacific Northwest and apparently like every little town in um, Skagit County, they all had like a different pickle recipe and you knew what what pickle you were eating from what town because it all was like a little bit different but it was like a culture where each town has a little productive um culture and a little um you know something that that it's distinct it's and and that brings you some cohesion and that sort of social cohesion on the human scale on the known scale a sort of dunbar number thing um where this dunbar number idea is basically you know, humans are used to living in, in communities of an X number, maybe it's 150, the people talk about different numbers, um, where you're known, you're, it's, a, it's a known scale of humans to know. And um, in that, it's, it's sort of going back to this embedded society idea, you know, you really cannot abide such extreme inequality if the scale is at that scale so that it's really just a, a, a low carbon small scale human scale um living makes it so a lot of those solutions just sort of happen organically or naturally because they really you just can't abide this level of exploitation at the scale of a village or a bioregion you just can't um it just doesn't work there's too much come up and people know what's going on um on the on the issue of um, not everybody to be a subsistence producer, I I think that that is there's absolutely room for division of labor in this small scale low carbon future, um, but I just think that ninety five percent of people cannot be coders and five percent of people producing everything. It has to be a bit a bit more of a balance, you know. And I think the way that we have it now is just so many people in white collar professions. Um, and not in any productive capacity whatsoever. Um, I really like the idea of um, even if you're not a subsistence food producer, for example, and you you are a coder still, okay, but but you have um, a, you have chickens and you have like five peach trees or something like that. You know, everybody has a hand in something. Um, maybe they're maybe they're. Um, kids are part of the cheese making club and that's you know they're you know everybody I think I think if we just try to think about it you know if you've ever been to a place where there's a lot of small scale kitchen gardens for example um, you just kind of feel this general web of production everybody's involved in the web in one way or another this sort of um, interconnectedness and and I think in my community here in Uruguay um, you know all of our shopping is around neighbors and this community. I mean, our, our, we're from a, a community that's highly diverse agricultural production. Um, we're part of a web, a networked web of, of production in this little, I mean, you could call it a little bioregion that we're in. Um, that, you know, I think it, it does, you don't have to be, it doesn't always have, your brain always have to go to like the word, you know, I'm a hundred percent backbreaking labor, cutting wheat by hand or something like that. It could be, you just have, everybody has a little hand in it and everybody does their part. No, I don't, I don't want to flood Uruguay, but Uruguay is actually number 10 on the top 10 list of places to retire in the world and, uh, uh quality of living social uh, care, uh, health care, things like that. So there's a lot to say. The, the, the things that you touched upon, 
resonate so nice. Uh, there's a term glocal, global, local, but there's also local futures, local economies. Um, and how do we bring, you know, so, some places around the world, you're like, oh, I grew up here, I, I was in this place. And now you go back <clears throat> to these places and there's no more local production. Everything's farmed in or trucked in from somewhere else. Um, and if we can bring that local production, that local pride, instead of our children or, or those great producers saying, I'm sick of this small town life. I'm going to move somewhere to the big city or move somewhere else where I can do this, that every place on the world has that balance or equality to say, no, right where I was born has all the basic needs of infrastructure that I need, has all the foods that's produced here, great diversity, great variety of, of what we have here. And I don't need to move to the big city to, to see that success. Okay, if you're a coder, if you're um, doing those different types of jobs, then maybe that would be there. But if it was a true local economy that had all those things, they need coders in that city. They need people who build those renewable and sustainable buildings and do the coding and, and bring that to your governance of your city. So the, the, the things that allows them to operate like the big New Yorks, like the Californias, like, like the Los Angeles and, and Hollywood, wherever, to have those same tools but to have it say, yeah, I'd love to go to Uruguay. I'd love to go to Europe and certain parts of Europe to, to have that diversity and see the nature and to, to experience that. But guess what? That infrastructure, a lot of those same things I have in my own community because we're producing it on our own. We're doing it a, a, a little bit different, but we have that basic need in that infrastructure. And you mentioned Detroit. Um the infrastructure's gone, the support's gone, the, the production's gone, but now it's, it's slowly coming back and, and, and yeah. you know, the, the hood farming and that, and it's gotten uh, great, but that's kind of the mindset we get in. We're still global citizens, we're still in this global community, but it's just uh, a little bit different. We're really running out of time. I've asked you tons of questions. We could talk for hours, but I have, I have four really important questions that I always ask all my guests. Um, and uh, this is the probably the hardest question I'll give you today. And it's, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you, Ashley? Not someone else, not your husband, for you. What, wait, what does, what does it look what like? What does for a world that works for everyone look like for, to you? Okay. Um, I think it, it, um, it looks like coherent interdependence, you know, and I think that starts at the scale of being a person who is good at being interdependent. So that requires all sorts of psychological strength and skills and, and, um, and, and, you know, social skills. Um, up to raising children who, who understand how to be inter interdependent and, and modeling that within, you know, marriage, for example, um, making a, a point to have interdependence be, a, a, you know, and, and coherent interdependence be a priority in school, um, in economies, in, in every aspect of society, um, this, this sort of coherent interdependence requires skills um, both of the individual and um, the community and the ways in which we relate to nature and the economy and um, the environment and and um, so I think I think to me you this we've talked about it a couple times but the sort of web anal analogy is nice you know the ways in which we're all connected to one another via a, a web and and the sort of um you pull on one string and everything's connected to to to, to everything else and um so that, that's what it looks like to me yeah next question is you do the rhizoma field school and i'd like to kind of get uh Where's that going next? What, how, how has it been? And where, where, what are your next steps? Is there some things we can look forward to there? 
Yes. So um, thank you for asking. The um, Rizoma Field School um, sort of came out of this, all of my research, all of my whole project of my life is, is you know, how can we accelerate sustainable, you know, low carbon um, living livelihoods? And so um, typically we host students here. Um, we bring students from North America and we have them work alongside our community members who are small scale sort of agroecological producers. Um, that paused during the pandemic. And, and we do think a student group will be coming um, from Ohio State University in May of 2022. That'll be our first uh, post pandemic. Let's just put that in quotes. I hope it's true. Um, group, but um, in the meantime, I've been focusing on um, online education and I'm thinking underneath the umbrella of, um, of uh, Rizoma Field School, I'll be, um, I'm, I have seen this, this absolutely massive interest in small scale production. And so I started um, by hosting, I, I just sort of built this class from scratch called Homestead Incubator. Um, and it's a sort of our pilot class and I have students in it right now. And I got a bunch of different homesteaders uh, and experts to come on as guest lecturers every week to talk about you know, their, their approach to small scale production and um, the way they think about low energy future and all of this stuff and all the students have to think about the ways in which they're they can get onto some land and maybe even build community or even if they're in the city what can they learn what kind of skills what how do they approach this what should they be thinking about um, and then you know a bunch of students are saying you know I would love to learn take an online class where I have to, I learn how to make my own bread or learn how to make cheese or or anything along those lines. So, um, and it's just so funny that it's an online class, but some people feel more comfortable with that. So, you know, you show up to the class, you have to have these ingredients and we're, and we're baking. So um, I think we're gonna, we're gonna go in that direction and um, just follow the interest and demand of students who are saying, you know, I'd love to get some productive capacity. Um, and then I think simultaneously, what's really, really important to me is to hold up as experts um, those people who are doing small scale production and have all that knowledge. I mean, just thinking about sourdough starters and rennet and all this different stuff that's normal home production stuff that we sort of lost that knowledge. So um, to, to pay those people as instructors and put them together with the people who want to learn, I think um, there would be nothing that would fit my mission more than, than that. So I'm going to experiment with that a bit. That's great, and we'll we'll put we definitely put the link to the Rhizome Field School uh, uh, in the podcast show notes, and look forward to that. And I think it's very necessary a uh, mutual um, admiration that we have is Justin Rhodes, I believe, and he has uh, the P Abundance Plus network where it's all online kind of videos and and learning where people all over the world can go in and and, and you know just realize the the learning lessons and, and different things of homesteading of, of farming of having doing permaculture chickens etc um, that I, I think you know especially during times of the pandemic I just got over um, a, a bad bout with with the cold myself and so it, it you, you need to go online you can't always travel you can't always do it so what what are the ways to bring it back to those local economies and futures if there was one or two messages you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life what it, would it be your messages um i think uh don't underestimate the um, the power in your own two hands. Um, you know, and I think I think a lot of people, um, you know, if you're raised in a city and used to purchasing most things that you need to live, um, just think, oh no, I I can't do that. <laughs> no way can I produce anything really um, of substance and. Um, you know, coming from somebody who's from the south side of the city of Chicago, who really has not been, um, you know, was not raised with any hands-on skills, um, I think uh, you, you might be surprised at how easy it is and um, how joyful um, and the sort of slippery slope of what it leads to. So, um, so believe in yourself and, and take one step in the direction of, of producing something and, um, and then come find me on Twitter and tell me how it goes. <laughs> What have you experienced or learned in your journey so far that you would have loved to know from the beginning, from the start? Um, 
I think to be gentle with oneself in the process of, um, of learning a low carbon, um, life, learning how to live a low carbon life. Um, I think, um, in general, we sort of, um, underestimate the the psychological and emotional and spiritual process that is involved in um in in trying to re-embed ourselves in community and and nature and um and the act of work like i said in my book um and it's just slow it's and it's necessarily slow because it's it's a it's an internal process you know so i think um, to be gentle with oneself in, in your journey. And it's okay to feel some sense of like frustration or doom or, or anger or denial. I mean, almost feels like the, the stages of grief, you know, we're, we're sh shifting from one society, we're accepting the loss of one society and, and moving on to um, the, the birth of a new one. So I think, um, I guess, to just be gentle with oneself in that process. I love it. Subsistence agriculture in the U.S., Ashley, thank you so much for letting us inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure. That's all I have, unless you want to ask me something or if there's something that you didn't get to say, now is your chance before I tell you goodbye. Nope, just, uh, I, I guess the only thing is come find me on Twitter. This is where I'm always posting about all my, my newest ideas and insights. It's at Restoma School. I'm sure you'll have it in the show notes, but um, I will that's absolutely where you can put it in the show notes. And that's where you can come find me and talk to me. Great. Thanks Thank so you so much, Ashley. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mark. Bye.